So tonight we're going to talk about main area birding with the bird chat team with Deborah, Susan, and myself. And we're going to talk about different ways to bird in new locations. And we all have experienced different, uh, different modes of birding. And just to give you just some ideas and just for your future reference and also talk about Maine and surrounding areas. All right, Susan, you wanna talk about this part? Sure, so why this area? As you can say, this is from eBird, this is a copy of all the hotspots, quite a few hotspots, quite a few red hotspots, kind of a good selection of different places. Let's go to the next one, next slide. So the habitats in Maine, are just we've got pelagic, we've got shores, bogs, marshes, lakes, streams, deciduous forests, boreal forests, subalpine, alpine, grasslands. There's all kinds, I'm probably missing something, but lots of different types of habitats, which mean different birds in different areas. Next. So I asked Alex what he thought the best time to take a trip to Maine is and he for birding and he said June. And this is kind of why we've got birds that are singing. We've got birds that are, as you can see by this yellow warbler, these are all <clears throat> from Paula Duenas that came on our trip with us. This is <clears throat> yellow warbler collecting spider webs for nesting. <clears throat> we have courtship lease turns or courting and nesting on the beach. We've got families, common nighters. We saw chicks of piping plovers. Everybody, all the birds are up about their singing. So for us in Florida, we don't get to hear those cool songs, but up there, lots of singing going on, lots of activity. So this June, according to Alex, he feels this is the best time to get the most birding bang for your buck. <laughs> Next. So three ways to bird in Maine. There's family trips because nothing better than taking your family along. There's birding festivals and there's tour groups and guides. So the first we're gonna start with is family trips by Kathy. Okay, so prior to Orange Audubon taking their wild side trip, which I would have been more than happy to go on, but it conflicted with work. Um, my family decided to go to Maine and it's uh, my second trip up there, but it's been many, many, many years. And I was not a birder the first time I went up. So um, going to Maine as a family was a wonderful experience. Here is some advantages. Um, going with your family can be a more affordable. You can split costs with your family, bond with your family. Um, my grandson was there, so it does build birding and nature interest in younger generations. And you can be more flexible with, you know, with weather concerns and other things that come up. Disadvantages is definitely birding is not a primary goal. Uh, the group might have split interests and the activity level must match all participant levels. And so, um, as you can see here, um, if you're wondering about the photo on the bottom left, that's part of our, we went on a moose safari and our guide actually gave us lunch by this beautiful river that was way out in the middle of nowhere. And it was just really pretty amazing family time for that. So um, the first place we, we, we decided where to stay based on two trips that my family agreed to. One was um, going to see puffins on a, a tour boat, which I'll talk about. And the other was going on a moose safari. So my daughter's very, very good with um, Airbnb. And so she was able to locate one by close to each of those locations. So um, our first location was Georgetown Island, Maine, which is an island sort of close, it's 45 minutes from Booth Bay Harbor. So those of us from Florida, going places in Maine was a little bit different because there was not as many connecting roads. I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing because Maine is very green and very natural. And I totally would be happy with not having roads 
and having more greenery. So you basically, if you're on the island here, you have to travel up the island and then come back down to the next island, which is great. Um, and as you're traveling, I mean, flowers everywhere and just so many trees and just amazing. So this is actually the view out of our first Airbnb. It was on a small lake. Um, birds right there. So, you know, staying at Airbnb, if you're a birder and with your family can be really good because you can always walk outside and see things. And that's what I would do. And it's very relaxing. So you adopt a patch, which is what I did because I was there for um, four days and this was the Airbnb. This was woods all around it. And then this path led out to the, the lake and they actually did have um, canoes and kayaks there that we were able to use. And um, so because family's on a slightly different schedule and birders generally get up early, I'd be up many, many hours before the rest of the family. So I would take walks. And like Susan was saying, I got to agree that June was a great time to be there because the warblers are all singing in the vireos and red eye vireo was one of the most commonly heard birds I heard. And yes, I did use Merlin a lot more as a guide. I would use Merlin and then I would make sure that I could match the sound if it wasn't a new bird like red eye vireo or find the bird, which was kind of hard. So this was really cool. One day when I went for one of my walks, I, it's hard to spot these birds because, okay, Florida trees are high, but these were even higher. Um, and lots and lots of foliage on the, of the trees. But if you look up here, I saw this, this bird fluttering around with something and it was a red-eyed vireo with a luna moth. And the luna moth just blends right in with the leaves. And that, I just watched it for the longest time. It was kind of, if you love luna moths, it was kind of sad because it's a beautiful moth, but that bird had a feast and I could just watch them taking the whole thing apart on one of my little walks. So some of the other birds, you know, um, some I'm familiar with like pine warblers, but they were on the ground and that one had some kind of very interesting insect that I was not able to identify. And then, you know, Merlin kept telling me Philadelphia Viri and I've only seen them a few times. So finally one sat out, but just the bird song was unreal and thrushes. It was the um, hermit thrush and the elevation I was at. And just in the morning walking and hearing that was uh, just, you, you can't, it's priceless, even though you don't see the bird. Um, brown creepers. You know, I was hearing a bird that I first thought was uh, cedar waxwings because they're very high pitched. And I've seen brown creepers once in Florida, but not enough to really know it. And then Merlin kept telling me brown creeper and I just was patient. So if you're birding a patch, it's slow birding, you take your time. And the weather's gorgeous, so it's not like you're burning up. It's very pleasant. Um, were some mosquitoes, but not horrible. And finally, I was able to locate the brown creeper. And after a very long time, take a photo because they are hard. They're like you know, like our um, like like black and white warblers are moving all around. And they had red squirrels. So if you've never been up north, the red squirrels about half the size of a gray squirrel, and they make bird-like noises, which confused me for a little while until I saw them do it. And lots of white-breasted nuthatches. There were um, red-breasted nuthatches, but I was not able to photograph those. They were moving around a lot too much, but these were all around and a lot, very entertaining to watch. And I didn't get a lot of lifers. Got a few on the, the boat trip, which I'll talk about to see puffins. And then we were on a moose safari, which our focus was finding moose. And we were way up um, past Moosehead Lake on roads that really you don't want to travel on in a rental car. So it was good to go with a guide and he, you know, we COVID tested and he put us in his vehicle, had very thick tires and we're on roads with shale, which could pop tires very easily. So we were up in the um, boreal forest and uh, always checking bodies of water for moose. And then I saw, and I, and I had been looking at eBird, so I kind of knew what I was looking for. And I saw these birds and I realized, oh, it's a common merganser, which was a life bird because they have, unlike um, the red breasted, they have a white chin and um, they were beautiful now here in the rocks. 
And so um, I'm probably going to mispronounce this. So the person from Maine, for, please forgive me. This is Mount Katahdin. This is the start of the Appalachian Trail, which goes to Georgia. And so we were up here in this, this part of Maine in a small town in an Airbnb. It was beautiful. Um, the day we're on the Moose Safari, actually the clouds had lifted from this mountain, which is usually not seen. So just gorgeous, remote. Um, right up here, Moosehead Lake is like right around here. Oops. So something to keep in mind if you're with family is really look carefully where you're hiking. Um, there's, a, there's several Audubon sanctuaries up there from the main Audubon. And um, it wasn't exactly what I expected because here a sanctuary, the actual building, you know, with some educational materials would be pretty close to a parking lot. Well, this one you had to hike. And on the information, it said moderate. We started hiking and it was like scrambling over rocks. And for Mainers, I'm sure it is moderate, but for us flatlanders, it was kind of a challenge, but we did make it up. We didn't get to the summit. I hear the summit is really gorgeous. Um, we made it to this point, which is an overlook, but um, we did make it to the Audubon Sanctuary. And as we were walking, you know, we're hearing all the singing birds and things like that. And it was definitely a challenge. Um, and in retrospect, had I read it more carefully, would have found out there was an access road that we could have walked up. That was a lot easier. Live and learn. So here's some other birds in the local patches where I stayed. Um, some of the ones that, you know, winter with us, the chipping sparrows, which have a really unusual song, um, common loon, which were in their breeding colors, and the Eastern Phoebe, who has a nice grasshopper. And, you know, warblers, uh, American goldfinch, um, Savannah sparrow, the yellow warblers was the only warbler that I could really get a decent picture of because, and they were actually by, by the beach. They were in some willow type tree. I don't think I identified it, but they were, they were low enough. They were able to, you were able to see them and they were just gorgeous. And the fun thing I got to see on one of my walks is I saw these chickadees being very, very active. Of course, these are black cat chickadees. They have a little bit more gray than ours and their, their calls are a little bit different. And I saw them flitting back and forth. And then I found the nest cavity. It was very hard to photograph because he was moving around so quick. And I saw them carrying caterpillars. So that was really a lot of fun. And we went um, on the hardy boat cruises. So it's one of those options, very inexpensive really. And it, it's an hour and a half um, boat tour out to Eastern Egg Rock Island. And if you watched, um, one of our previous bird chats about Project Puffin, which I have the shirt on for, this is where they do it. So it's kind of cool because I remember the bird chat and lo and behold, there was one of the researchers wearing one of those funny hats because they have the nesting turns, which go in the gulls and they kind of go crazy. And um, they have a hat and she also had something that they could kind of fend off those. So unlike what you're gonna hear with the wild side tour, we didn't spend a lot of time there, but we did get to see the puffins. Um, there was a lot of people on the boat and they're mostly not birders. And so you kind of, it's hard to get to the rail. It was really nice. This was the uh, local Audubon naturalist and they'd hold up big signs and explain what we'd see. And, you know, if you're with family, this was definitely a good option. And there was the puffins. We saw them in the water and on the rocks. And this is from our moose hunt. And that moose was really far away and forgive the blurriness of the picture. And um, some other really cool things that we found, uh, chipmunks, beautiful flowers. And this is a mink. This was down at one of the Airbnbs. I was just sitting and just looking out. I saw a flash of black and then by miracle got a picture. And I, I don't know what's carrying, but it looks like some kind of mouse or something. Really fast animal. And you know, memories made together last a lifetime. So that's family birding. Now on to Deborah. Okay. Well, I'm a big fan of birding festivals. I go to them around the country. And I had read about the Acadian Birding Festival next in Acadia National Park next. 
Um, well, first of all, what are advantages of um, birding festivals instead of other forms of travel? It's more affordable than private tours or guides. The emphasis is on the region's hotspots, specialties. You have your local guides and you meet birders from different areas. Disadvantages are that activities are scheduled, there's less flexibility, and the better trips fill fast. So you gotta register quick. Next. So I heard about the Cadia Birding Festival and went. Um, it's a well-established festival. It's in its 24th year next year. That, just to put it in perspective, Space Coast was just like two years older before um, they finally quit on it. Um, so the part of uh, Maine that this is, is down east, uh, the far top right part, and it, that borders Canada, New Brunswick. And it's this uh, lower uh, county, Hancock. In a minute, I'm going to talk about Washington County. Um, so Cadia Festival has wonderful leaders, wonderful trips, just gorgeous scenery there at Acadia National Park, Mount Desert Island. Next. And they have good, great keynotes. They, they bring in some big name speakers over the years. Next. And they have a pelagic, which is on a big boat to see the puffins. It's the right time. It's June, early June, first week of June. Next. And the year I went, which was quite a long time ago, I don't care, maybe 2012 or something. Uh, this man on the right, Bob Duchesne, was a leader, and he was, I, I took his big van, big down east van trip all day, where they go to the northeast part, Washington County, and he told us about the down east birding festival, which was the week before, and that was his favorite area, down east, uh, that far right corner, Lebec area. Um, so after going on his big van trip that time, I, I went the next year to the Down East Festival. And I'll talk about that next. Um, and Bob gives a talk on birding by year. That's excellent. And, uh, you know, a lot of, oh, well, he takes you on your van, the van tour. He shows you the spruce grouse, several places. He actually, this one's named Bruce. He, he, he knows them very well knows exactly how to call them out. And uh, I got to see the Red Cross bills and he, he, Bob uh, does a thing with the Woodcock's uh, lecking behavior at night. And next, so this is the Down East Spring Festival Memorial Day weekend. It'll, it'll be in its 20th year. So it's an established festival, it's much smaller and um, less expensive than other festivals. And you often see some of the same leaders again and again. Well, they're local leaders. And this was a bog field trip. And the cool thing that we saw on that one that really impressed me was the palm warbler um, singing the, this rattly trill. I mean, we know the palm warbler so commonly down here in Florida in the winter. And who would think that they nested in a place like this, a bog? Next. And we stayed at Cobbs Cook State Park, uh, which is a gorgeous state park. And the hermit thrushes were right there in our campsite. And anyway, I highly recommend this little festival uh, down east. And there's, there's two other festivals that are listed online, but um, those are the two big ones, Acadia and down east. And I'll just introduce our trip to Maine with Orange Audubon's trip with Wildside Nature Tours. I should tell you how we have a relationship with Wildside. We've met them at birding festivals over the years, and then um, they started sponsoring the North Shore Birding Festival, sending first Greg Miller for several years, and now Alex Lamoureux. And we, we went with um, Alex and Gabriel Lugo from Puerto Rico uh, right before COVID on a Puerto Rico trip. And so we were looking around for another trip to do as a chapter. And just uh, for the reasons that Susan was describing, Maine sounded really good. And so that's what we did. Um, and this is the final five of us that 
um, were able to stay on the trip with Alex and Alan Needle, who's an old friend of his from when they did research at um, the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge when they were pretty young. And um, he works at Manomet Bird Observatory. And Alex also works partly there. And anyway, um, we, yeah, we found Alan to be excellent. And we actually hope to get him to come to our festival, North Shore Birding Festival. But Alex, we think, is the cream of the crop. And uh, we'll go with him again. Um, we're just trying to figure out where. Next. Susan, you want to take this over? Sure. So tours, tour guides, some of the advantages is they, like Alex was just there with another tour a week earlier, so he had really good knowledge of what they're seeing, where things are, and just what's happening right now. You also don't have to worry about booking that hotel or the boat trip because they take care of all of it. They even kind of have a, they've been going there for years. So they know what's the best place to go eat or what's available. So it kind of helps. And I think if you look at the counts for everything, if you're going with either an individual guide or a tour, you're going to get more birds. If that's something you really love, you're going to see lots of birds. Disadvantages, it can be a little bit pricier um, because they do cover everything and everything is kind of included there. Some meals you have to pay for yourself, but all the hotels and vans and pickups and stuff. And they're also group oriented. So if you decide, oh, I don't really want to do that. Well, you know, you have to go with a group. I have no problem with that. I think it's great. Travel disruptions. I put that in because air travel right now is really bad. If you do try to do something, I would say get there a day ahead because it's taking a long time to get there. We did have a lot of travels and uh, took a long time to get back. So then the other thing that's important, especially after this last trip is trip insurance. So we had three people that had to drop off because of COVID and one with an injury and one with a death in the family. So trip insurance kind of saves if any of that stuff came up, it's a good thing to have. So these two pictures, the yellow-bellied flycatcher and the moose are kind of some of the advantage of having your own person looking things up. This yellow-bellied flycatcher, we're driving down the street. Alex just says, pull over here. So we're just off on some street by Moose Bog and there's a yellow-bellied flycatcher right next to the road. It was great looks, even I got a good picture. Same thing with the moose. We did take a look at the Google recommendations and we did drive them after we saw this moose, but the, the only moose we actually saw was with Alex doing his research into iNaturalist. So I probably wouldn't have even thought to look there, but we got a great picture of the moose. You can see he's right next to the road. So that kind of makes it kind of cool. So next. So here's, we did eight days, 33 locations, 178 checklists, a total of 162 species. Some of the highlights were Seal Island, Mount Washington, Scarborough Marsh, Kennebec Plains, um, Dixville Notch, Moose Bog. And of course, you talked about the leaders, Alex and Alan. And then from the trip report, this is kind of where we went. Those are all the places that we we're at in a lot of the hot spots that we covered. So next. So I'm going to kind of go through a, some of what we saw and what we did. So day one, we arrived and we did go to a pond that's close to the airport while we were waiting for people. So a lot of the things we got to see, I don't have pictures of everything. It would be impossible. Plus I'm not that good a photographer, but we did get to see nesting orchard orioles and nesting Baltimore orioles and black cap chickadee families. So we do have a um, little black cap chickadee eiders. Um, this is a beautiful view. The vistas in Maine are just spectacular as you can see that kind of bog area. And of course the um, song sparrows, lots of song sparrows everywhere. I think everywhere you went had a song sparrow. So very 
kind of good to hear that in the background because everything is singing. Next. One of the places we did go to is the fish ladder. So the lower right picture shows the ladder. This is like a staircase waterfall built of stone where the fish actually go up to go back up into the areas, the lakes and the rivers to breed. So this picture on the right, when we were there, they did have a metal mesh over it to keep these beautiful um, gulls. Um, that are here, the gulls that are here from eating the fish. So there was a lot of gulls on some of the areas that didn't have mesh on. And so you could see them kind of positioned everywhere. So next, that night we spent at Camden River House Hotel is a real cute hotel, Camden, which is the port. And we had dinner looking out over the port. So we get to watch all, all the fishing boats come in and go and, and the sailboats kind of there for the evening. So the next day, if we go to the next slide, was our pelagic trip. So we went to Seal Island. Um, as you can see, and we had lots of seals, harbor seals. But this is us on the trip. I do recommend if you have 20 bucks to get rain pants because the boat, the seats do get a little wet. This, we were on a smaller boat than the one that Deborah showed. So it was kind of nice. Our leaders, we had two leaders constantly looking. We saw beautiful vistas like this um, lighthouse on the way out. And the first bird that we saw was the black guillemot. So we started seeing them in the wake and flying by. You can kind of see that white patch when they fly. Next. Then as we got closer to the island, we started seeing puffins in the water, puffins flying by. And on Seal Island, we got lots of puffins. Puffins, this is just one photo, lots of puffins all over the rocks. Puffins, they had a big camera uh, installed to take, I think, a video of puffins. So it was really kind of fun to see all these, they're beautiful birds. Next. My other favorite were the razor bills. These guys remind me of penguins. They have a, that kind of big kind of bill, the razor, I guess it's the razor bill, but we did see them flying. We saw them roosting on the rocks and we saw them in the water. So big flocks of them, a I think they're a beautiful bird. So that was kind of my other, my second favorite. These were all lifers for me. And next. So also we got to see um, the great sheer water as upper right. This was unusual. We didn't go quite as far out, but luckily this guy kind of came in a little closer and flew right over our boat. So we got to see a little bit, uh, a bird that would normally be seen a little bit farther out to see. We do get a few of the common mirrors, again, another lifer for me. And Arctic terns do breed on the island. So lots of Arctic terns, there were common terns there. The other thing that we got to see were the great cormorants. They were nesting all over the island and great black backed gulls were there. And this guy's kind of, I don't know what he's doing with his neck, but he's probably planning to steal an egg or two. <laughs> so, but those were some of the few birds that we saw there. Next. So day three, we headed out to Scarborough Marsh. This is a big area. We actually birded several different areas of the marsh. Um, and this is just some of the great views. If we look at the next slide, these were our target birds. So the target birds were the salt marsh sparrow and the Nelson sparrow. We did not miss, especially in the salt marsh sparrow, these guys were kind of jockeying for positions on some of the upright stumps and twigs that were sticking up. Um, the Nelson sparrows, we did see them also. I, I'm not the best photographer, so these aren't the greatest. And these guys are fast. So, but we did get to see both of them. This is our group as we're looking out over this marsh for the birds. Um, we did see other birds there. It was typical like great egret glossy ibis. And if we go to the next 
one. We also saw the eastern willets. They have a good population there, and I guess they're starting to increase their breeding there, according to Alex. Cedar waxwings, again, song sparrows, um, savannah sparrows. I think we also saw lots of birds there. It was a great, just a great afternoon, and I think we were mostly entertained by those salt marsh and Nelson sparrows. They were just the most fun to watch flying around. Next. So we got in the car, went to a different part of the marsh, and we got to see, for me, and another life for the American black duck. There was actually more than one, but um, black ducks, we don't get them quite all the way down where we are, so that's a special treat for us. The other thing we saw, we got all excited. I think the leaders got very excited when they saw the long head feathers on this bird. Unfortunately, because of the gray coloration, they determined it is a little egret tricolor heron hybrid. So Alex was saying they do get little egrets that come over from England maybe once a year, and they do see them at this marsh. So this was kind of a special treat. We really watched this bird, and I probably have a lot of pictures of this bird, but if we ever kind of, if you were ever in that area, you want to take a look and see how these and look for those tall feathers, the long feathers on the head. Next. So we, then we headed to Higgins Beach. Um, Higgins Beach, we got another life for me as the roseate terns. They do nest. There's an island offshore where they nest. But on the shore, there were, is an area where piping plovers and least terns are nesting. So that was a, just a really treat watching piping plover. Some of them had already had their chicks and they're kind of running around. The least turns, if we go to the next slide, some of them, um, oops, so I guess I don't have that here, but some of them were uh, also doing some of their um, mate. They're kind of playing with each other, feeding each other fish, kind of flirting. So getting ready to get that nesting season going. So next. Okay, then we went to Kennebunk Plains. So, so we're kind of changing it up, going out to the plains, looking for sparrows. We did miss the clay colored sparrow, but we did get to see a vesper sparrow, grasshopper sparrow. We did get field sparrows, savannah sparrows, chipping sparrows, lots of sparrows. But in addition, some warblers. Alex took these great pictures of a prairie warbler and a pine warbler. And the pine warblers that we saw there were beautiful, golden, very bright. So all the, I, we didn't see the females that could be on nests, but very good um, sample of the male pine warblers. So then brownfield bog. So out of the bog, I kind of thought we were going to first head to kind of a wet area, but really we first, it was kind of woody at the entrance. So this is great. This is the area where you're going to see a lot of the warblers and they're singing. Unlike Florida, where we have to be happy with chipping, these guys are all singing and calling. We did get great views of a rose-breasted grosbeak that kind of followed us, a black and white warblers. Common yellow throat. We got the red eyed vireos, warbling vireos, yellow throated vireos, lots of vireos, um, and lots of flycatchers. So we also saw the, um, actually, I think we also had red starts and all the pretty much all of the warblers that you can imagine that we see here and we get all excited to see, and they're just all over here. We were walking in the lower center picture. By the water, we were looking for the alder flycatcher, which did cross our path right when we decided we we're going to leave. So we did get to see that along with some indigo, uh, indigo bunting that flew past. So lots of good birds just in the just in the non bog section of the brownfield bog. And if we go next, we head to Moose Bog, or this is where we looked for the spruce grouse. Unfortunately, it was very windy. So I don't think they were out and about. You can kind of tell by the warblers that we did see that kind of puffed up. A black birdian was, and a black throated blue just right out in the parking lot as 
were the Canada Jays. Um, some of the fun things we did get to see tea berry. I, I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember tea berry gum, but I think my mom used to buy it. And if we ate some of the tea berries, and again, just like the gum flavor, so kind of cool. Lady Slippered Orchids. I don't think my presentation really addresses the beautiful flowers and vegetation and butterflies that we saw and dragonflies, but it's kind of hard to fit all into one presentation. So, but as we're walking down the path, we got to see again a lot of the chickadees. It was just really good. Um, we did see the gold, um, gold crowned and flashing his grown crown and the ruby crowned kinglet, both the kinglets, and they were all flashed their crowns, which I had never seen before. I've seen a lot of ruby crowned kinglets, never seen them flash their crowns. So this was a special treat. Next. So then we walked out to Bog. This lake is created by Beaver Dam. And the next slide will show where they live. But it's kind of has a lot of beautiful um, vegetation. They're pitcher plants. We did get like swamp sparrows. There was a lot of red winged blackbirds. Eastern kingbirds had a nest in some of the trees nearby. And you could kind of see them going in and out of the nest. So it was really kind of nice. And if we go to the next picture, this kind of shows the bottom right, shows the picture of the beaver lodges that are on the lake. So the beavers, either their descendants or maybe the beavers that built this lake live there, probably descendants, but that's kind of the beavers. And then also we kind of were treated to some hand feeding. Ellen, there's a few birds, including a red winged blackbird that will come and sit on your hand and eat. So they were kind of demonstrating that to us. It's just kind of fun. And next. So then day six, one of my favorite things, Mount Washington State Park. Again, we did take the auto road, but there is park tours. There's a cog railway. And if you really want to hike, there's a shuttle to bring you one direction. So as we go up, so what I did as we went up, Alan was telling me about the different zones. So again, all of this kind of we're part of the boreal forest. So when we're on the bottom level here, the beach and birch echo zone, we're seeing a lot of the warblers. We saw uh, bluebirds. We are seeing, hearing vireos. This is the area we heard, heard hermit thrush. This is the area of the hermit thrush. So this is their zone. So then as we get higher in the mountain, we'll go to the next slide. We're gonna hit the spruce fir and mountain ash zone. This is where you'll see Swainson's thrush. These are some of the bigger fir trees. <coughs> and as we continue, we'll go up to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. This is also there, or you could find a black-backed woodpecker. Unfortunately, we did dip on that one and <laughs> we did not see him. It was kind of windy. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is kind of the transition zone from the tall trees to the stunted balsam firs as you go past the sign. We're up high. And let's go to the next slide. So this is the subalpine zone. It's got stunted balsam firs. This is the zone where you would find the Bicknell's thrush. We did find the thrush. It was so exciting for me. This was also very cold. It's very cold up here. If you do go, remember that the top of the mountain is quite different temperature than the bottom. So you do want to dress appropriately. It was a very windy day. It was pretty cold, especially for us from Florida. But if you dress appropriate in layers, it works out fine. Our guides kind of knew where the birds hung out. So that was a very good thing that they knew where to go. So the next slide will show some of the other birds, another lifer, the boreal chickadee. <clears throat> and our tour, we actually saw the boreal chickadee in three different locations. I have heard, he did say that the last tour they had didn't even see it. So we were pretty lucky in that. The beautiful white-throated sparrow sang 
pretty much everywhere we went. There were white-throated sparrows singing. It was a, quite a treat. There's also um, black pole warblers up this high. So that's one of the other birds that we saw. But again, it's getting colder. We're getting higher up the mountain and we go up another level and we're gonna hit the alpine tundra. This was very interesting to me because this is actually the breeding grounds for the American pipit. If it wasn't quite so breezy, you would see pipits standing on these rocks where they're kind of setting up their territories, eating bugs. Um, another interesting thing that we did see is an alpine azalea, as you can see on the right, it's probably a couple inches high. It's very, the winds coming off the mountain keep everything pretty low. It's very rocky. Um, it's amazing these birds like this area, but this is where their breeding grounds are. So in Florida, we see them in the fields. Up here, they're in this alpine tundra area. So then next, our next zone is the Rocky Summit. This is the top. We're at 6288 feet. There was snow. There was some ice. The place had been closed for three days before us because of ice and high winds. The tip top house is the old, if you were to hike up in the old days, this is what you would come to when you kind of to take a little break and get out of the cold was this rock structure. Now there is a museum, a visitor center, gift shops, there's restrooms, a place to get some food, and of course, a weather station. So we can go to the next, that's me at the summit. Somebody took my picture. Again, the temperature, um, it said that day was 33 to 40. I'm not sure about the 40. Wind speed was variable 33, um, probably was the average speed. It could go up to 50. Mount Washington does have the record for the second fastest wind speed recorded on earth. And as you can see, there was a lot of snow and ice still there up in the mountain. Some of the people coming up on this railway were wearing shorts and summer clothes and coming out. And I was like, mm, not too smart. But the other thing is if you do hike, keep in mind it's very, um, it, the temperature changes fast. It's pretty rocky for us in Florida. This is pretty advanced hiking. They did have a hiker passed away two days before we got there from hypothermia. So if the weather changes, there's nothing there's no trees, no big rocks for you to take shelter. So you have to really be a prepared hiker to do these trips. And this was in June. So next. So after that, we went to Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge. I think some of the fun things that we get to see are some of the breeding grounds. So we have Northern Harriers in this big picture in the background is where two northern harriers, they did fly by not very fast, so I missed them, but this is their breeding grounds. And I thought this is so much fun to see where they're coming. They spend the winter with us, but here they are in their breeding grounds and just to kind of see what it looks like. If we look some of the birds that we did get to see, Paula got a good picture of the Virginia rail. Um, chestnut sided warblers appeared to be the bird of everywhere. There, it seems like they were one of the most common of the birds that we got to see. So that was kind of a treat for us. Northern Perulas are up there. And we did get to see a white admiral butterfly, which is a subspecies of our red admiral butterfly that is up in the north. And Dixville Notch and Turbine Road, that was one of my favorite places. We just had so many birds. I can't even tell you what. Um, Swainson's thrush. I just put a picture of a few. We did get to see the Philadelphia Vireos. Actually, we saw several. They're in a little groups. Bay-breasted warblers. We did get to see a pair of those. They hadn't been seen in a few days, but we were lucky enough to be able to find them. Broadwing hawks. Those are the most common hawks that we saw, I swear, on my trip. They seem like they were everywhere. So that's kind of fun for us because we don't get to see them very often. Nashville warblers. Some of the other warblers I didn't get a picture of. Warbling vireos. We don't have those too often up here. Um, so that's kind of things that are very fun to, for us to see. 
This is the breeding ground, so lots of paired birds, lots of singing and nesting behavior. Again, one of the other, my favorite birds is a morning warbler. And at this top left picture shows its breeding habitat. So this is Alex and Alan checking out a known breeding area. And of course we were treated to the male. Um, he's on the right and lower left coming in to check us out and kind of maybe just feeding, doing his thing. So that was kind of a really nice treat us to see that breeding ground. And unfortunately, we do not get to see morning warblers here, but I do visit my sister in Ohio and get to see them occasionally up there. But that was kind of a special treat seeing their breeding grounds. We also did get to see this willow flycatcher on an area close by in Mesolonsky Lake. And hopefully I'm not killing this. And a lot of these bird photos are by Alex Lamoureux. And next. So our last day is a trip to the Milkhouse Organic Farm. We did get to see lots of nesting barn swallows, tree swallows. We saw cliff swallows flying overhead. There were bobolinks. This is not my picture of bobolink. My picture of bobolink is kind of blurry, but we did see bobolinks out in the fields. We did see savannah sparrows, lots of the different sparrows. Um, we did hear an indigo bunting. It was kind of a good, kind of just something different to see up in the air. We did have flying in different levels above each other. We had a broad tail hawk and below was a Cooper's hawk. And actually on the lowest level was a red tail hawk. So these, all these hawks, um, most of them in groups of two flying up in the air, kind of over these farm areas, which is just kind of a nice treat to see this. And we got to have an organic ice cream sandwich. In, from their store. So next, so we saw 162 species, 19 different warblers, nine raptors, two falcons, eight flycatchers, kingbirds, five vireos. And we got to see specialties for us, puffins, razorbills, great shearwaters, boreal chickadee, bicknose thrush, Canada jay, purple finches, juncos, broadwing hawks, morning warblers, warbling vireos. And of course, a moose, a beaver, a skunk, a raccoon, harbor seals, gray seals, um, cows, horses, sheep, all kinds of good things. And next. And here's our lovely group, Alex, Deborah, Grant, Paula, Pam, myself, Alan, Teresa, and Alan. This is the group before um, Teresa and Alan did have to drop out, but this is us in Camden posing. And you have to keep in mind, this is us after we come in on our flights and then spend a half day burning. So we're a little bit tired looking, but hey, it was a fun day. And any questions? Okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and look at the chat here. Um, all right, got that. All right, great presentation. Love the stories from Natasha. It's a great, uh, Paula says a great trip, Lo lovely region. Delcy says she'll miss us until September. Emily says fantastic. Or he says what a great trip. Jim, wonderful presentation. Is there any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Maine's a beautiful place and I it certainly is. want to go back. Good. It, it actually is so beautiful and it's so fun to see all those birds that we see kind of coming through and, and know that this is where they're heading. Yeah. Where they're yeah. nesting. So it's just really nice to see the different habitats. Let's see, I've got, let's see. So Bobby said, reminded me of my trips to Maine in the early 2000s went most to most of the places you visited. Great trip. And Anne says, feels like I was there. Oh, Terry wants to know, did people bring scopes? Actually, Deborah brought her scope um, because her husband did drive up and Alan and Alex both had scopes. So we did have scopes. I'm not sure if we needed all the scopes because they were good at getting people on with the two different scopes that Alan and Alex had. Couple of times we had three scopes, but a lot of the birds we didn't actually need scopes. <laughs> so, right. and on my family trip, 
I didn't bring my family trip because <laughs> space is a priority. Yeah, if home. you're flying, I don't, it's pretty hard to bring a scope. Yeah. So that's um, the advantage of going on a tour is they, yeah. they bring the scopes and, and on a festival, they bring scopes. So that's definitely right. an advantage of that. But binoculars work fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's good because they're very, Alan was really good at knowing bird songs. So he could hear it and we could look for it and find it. And actually both of them, Alex and Alan are really good at finding the birds and Alex kind of knows where to look. Like sometimes it's like, like I said, to find that yellow bellied flycatcher, it was just we stop the vans and pull over off the side of the road, get out. And it's like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, having, knowing where those spots are makes a big difference. All right. And Christine says, beautiful. Thanks. Love the puffins and the moose. Can you give a price range for a tour versus festival? As she's uh, never been on either. That's a great question. Um, I'll do it. Um, okay. Festival might be 200. If you take a bunch of trips over three or four days, 250. Of course, that then you have to get your own hotel and everything. Um, our trip was 2350 which included um, all the guiding eight days, plus the hotels. And the pelagic. And the pelagic, yeah. yeah. And it didn't include meals, but um, uh, it was important to get those hotels that I mean, were pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, some festivals like Susan and I did, we'll probably do a bird chat about this. We haven't, have we done that? Oh, don't even remember anymore. Anyways, when we did this little boutique festival in, Texas spring chirp it was all inclusive for 500 and that included lunch and dinner our, our whole day the van everything and the only thing that wasn't included was breakfast which the hotel was very reasonable and um we got breakfast so that was very affordable festival that we did up there and down there in Texas down there but it really varies you have to check out um the different festivals like mm -hmm. our festival you know locally here in central florida our, our um north shore birding festival we don't charge registration and our trips are very uh, reasonable compared to some that i've seen mm -hmm. so it does vary but not every place you want to go has a festival too so that's another consideration or at the time of year that you can go yeah. So. A festival is good because it kind of gives you kind of an introduction to the era, may also kind of introduce you to people that you may, if you decide to go back, use as guides. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of another advantage of a festival. A tour is nice because it's like, you don't you show up and pretty much it's, you know, the thought of who's the guide and where do we want to stay is pretty much taken care of. All of the hotels that we stayed at were very nice, actually. They're very big. I'm laughing because I've shared rooms in smaller hotels than I had in this festival and I was, or this tour, and I was by myself in the room. And it was like, man, I could get a few more people in there. This is big. So it's kind of a, the hotels were very nice that they selected. And so we did have a, they usually had free breakfast, although, you know, when you're burning, sometimes you leave before that. But a couple of days we did have the free breakfast in the hotels. So, if anyone's still on from the other Audubon chapters, um, if you're with a group like that, a burning group, uh, Wild Side will kick back a hundred dollars per person um, for your trip uh, to the chapter. So that's a real nice perk. And in general, we our experience with Wild Side has been very positive. They're very well organized, and their leaders are really good. Right. Puerto Rico was amazing. Same thing that um, Susan said, is the hotels were really nice. They brought us to great places to eat. And we saw so much of the island. Just right. Highly recommend. Uh, the Christine place, wants to know where to find out about festivals. Um, um, obviously, if, if you're a member of Audubon, a lot of people go to festivals. If you're in your chapter, just ask around. Well, but Deborah, um, do you have some more? Yes, it's online um, and the ABA site, American Birding Association and Cornell site. 
those are two places where they keep the good list. Mm -hmm. And we actually did a presentation on festivals. Um, if you can go through playlists and find it, find it on YouTube. Oh, Anne says she went to Spain with Wild Side. That must have been amazing. That would be amazing. That would be, that would be fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of tour companies, but just uh, we got hooked up with them and we, we like them a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stick with what 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 works good. They certainly do. Yeah. And it was fun. I did get like 12 lifers. So for me, that was just so fun to see new birds. That's something I get excited about. Yes. So again, be sure to check out our YouTube channel because we have and we do have one about our, our Puerto Rico uh, wild side tour from 2020. Just definitely check that out. And subscribe. We're at about 544 sub people subscribing. We, we'd like to get it a little higher. We love yeah. it. Right? Yep. So we will be back in September. So if you guys have anything specific, any festivals or anything that you want us to look up, let us know. Um, we probably will have something from next year because we probably will have another Orange Audubon uh, tour going somewhere next year. So kind of keep your eye open, see where we're heading. And if you can't make it, we probably will have a report on it because that's always fun to do. Um, and then again, we have our festival, which I'll have to say I was in Ohio and met somebody that was kind of very complimentary of our festival. So it's it's a little bit not as fancy, but it has really good birds. So that's always fun. Oh, whoever so, asked Rick Schofield, hey, um, Orange Audubon, are you, first of all, are you local? Uh, we can't remember your name. If, if you're local, we uh, every third Thursday, from September through June, we have our monthly programs. And this year, next year, we're gonna try them in person again at Lou Gardens. And, um, but otherwise the uh, bird chats will be the, the whatever is the first Thursday in September. Let's see, that would be the first. September, yeah, 1st. September 1st. So that's easy to remember. And if you're on the mailing list, um, then you'll, you'll be notified for sure. Um, and I presume you all are because we didn't have the link out otherwise. So, uh, yeah, we'll be corresponding towards September. We have some already some really great programs lined up, but we're definitely open to more suggestions. Just wanted to put it in my calendar before I forgot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, we will let everybody go. And thanks for your participation this season. Yeah. We've had a great time with yeah. this. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Right. And if you're local, we'll maybe see you on a survey or at our June Challenge celebration. Okay. We'll have that on our, our website and our social media. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs>